from the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 7, streaming now. Good evening to you at 7 o'clock. Hey, be careful out there. We've had just enough precipitation to cause problems on the road tonight. It's a WRTV Storm Team alert as we head towards a very cold weekend. Kevin is here with those details. And some of the slick streets occurring even with temperatures still above freezing. So as that temperature drops, I do expect some more issues on the roadway. We've bounced back and forth between uh, big snowflakes, rain, and even some sleet. But it's all going to end here in the next couple of hours from west to east. Then the temperature will fall. By midnight, this should be all into the Buckeye State. The wind will stay with us overnight, gusting to 30 miles per hour. That will help dry off some of the streets, but anything untreated, I think, could become quite slick. Temperatures as warm as they've been today in Indy, 36. It's 37 in Bloomington and Shelbyville, all above freezing. See the back edge right along the state line in the Wabash River? That will push to the east over the next couple of hours by 9 o'clock. Western Indiana drying out, Eastern Indiana drying out by the time we get to 11. You'll wake up to temperatures in the teens. That's why you'll need to be careful on roadways, especially bridges and overpasses from now through the morning. Now let's get the latest numbers showing the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on Indiana. The State Department of Health says another 2,403 Hoosiers have been diagnosed with COVID-19. 37 more Hoosiers have died. The total number of deaths is now 11,231. Since March, more than 633,000 Hoosiers have tested positive for COVID-19, and more than 7.1 million tests have been administered in Indiana. And tonight, leaders in Hamilton County are keeping a close eye on the number of COVID-19 cases in the 0 to 19 age group because right now they are seeing an uptick. And that is why a task force led by teenagers at eight local high schools is renewing its commitment to slowing the spread of the virus. The Show Some Class campaign is a partnership between the students and the health department. As students start their second semester and the COVID-19 vaccine comes online, They've updated the acronym CLASS and now stands for Commit to Self-Care, Learn About the Vaccine, Avoid In-Home Gatherings, Social Distance, and Mask Up and Stay Home. We really encourage our students to learn about the vaccine beyond TikTok. We really want our credible sources and we really want our students doing their research to truly know the importance of a vaccine and what they can do to help. The reason we pick those seniors is because we knew that they had the most to lose here proms, graduations, they wanted to be able to be in school with their peers. And it hasn't looked the same, but at least they're there. According to the State Department of Health, 19% of COVID-19 cases in Hamilton County are in the 0 to 19 age group. The state health leaders are working with the Indiana Minority Health Coalition to increase access to the COVID-19 vaccine and reduce skepticism with it among the minority populations. They say their first priority was making sure information about testing and the vaccine was available in multiple languages. Now they're trying to build confidence in the shot. They are working to identify trusted minority leaders in each community to help spread information about the vaccine. That could be anyone from a physician to a popular radio DJ. Then they will work on creating video testimonials and try to connect with those hesitant to get the shot. There's probably no more important public health matter than this. People are dying and people are disproportionately dying when they're people of color. Uh, if nothing changes, population of color will disproportionately not get the shot that they need the most because they're at greatest risk. According to the Indiana State Department of Health website, right now only 4% of COVID-19 vaccinations have gone to black Hoosiers, and they make up almost 10% of Indiana's population. A program hopes to provide a boost to local entrepreneurs and chefs who have struggled to keep up with chain restaurants during the pandemic. With delivery remaining popular for the foreseeable future, WRTV's Kevin Riddle shows you how a group is getting ready to help Hoosiers launch so-called ghost kitchens. While corporate-owned restaurants are held to the same standards as small family-owned restaurants, the mom-and-pop spots have been at a disadvantage as more people rely on apps and delivery services for dinner. They did not. Um, they were not ready for things like that. And so you saw people 
generally disappear, close back. You saw other people get an influx of sales and not know what to do, how to handle it. After witnessing that disadvantage, local nonprofit group Be Nimble is launching an accelerated program called The Melon Kitchen to teach small restaurant owners how to run a delivery only business from what is called a ghost kitchen. Program director Jasmine Long describes the concept as a restaurant where the customer never steps foot inside. Places who did not have ghost kitchens are building ghost kitchens. Something is happening where people want the food and they want it now. To be able to order McDonald's to your front door without going through the drive through It's happening. The transition is already here. We're not going back now that people are used to getting their food just like that. The program will set up shop at 16 Tech on Indiana Avenue, allowing chefs and business owners to launch their delivery service under the guidance of professionals that know how to run a restaurant and have the experience with the technology required to run a delivery service. Think Uber Eats or DoorDash. The kitchen's location in a historically black neighborhood and the name Melon Kitchen reflects the communities Be Nimble is trying to help. Melon, melanin, melon, watermelon, it's us. It's, you know, all the vibrant things that make us, us. Long says the program is open to any and everybody, but the heart of the mission is to help black and brown business owners catch up and compete with the big chains and corporations. That is because we are naturally and historically underrepresented in things like this. When you are combining tech plus food, that is something that we have never been privy to doing. Cameron Riddle, WRTV. Mellon Kitchen participants will also receive financial backing from money raised by the annual Party Grand Ball. The program is accepting applications right now. You can learn more at WRTV.com. All of March Madness on the men's side is already coming to Indy. Now even more college basketball appears to be on its way due to the pandemic restrictions elsewhere. Today we learn the Big Ten Conference will move its men's basketball tournament from Chicago to Indianapolis next month. One possible reason for this, looser pandemic restrictions here in Indiana as opposed to the Chicago area right now. The conference tournament is scheduled to take place March 10th through the 14th. The Big Ten men's tournament was also in Indianapolis in 2020. However, it was also an early victim of the coronavirus pandemic. The first round of games were played at Blank Bankers Life Fieldhouse on March 11th of last year, but the rest of the tournament was canceled the next day as events nationwide began shutting down. Now, of course, right after the Big Ten tournament, the NCAA men's tournament is scheduled to take place entirely in and around Indianapolis. The games will be played at multiple venues in Indy, as well as Mackey Arena in West Lafayette and Assembly Hall in Bloomington. The plan is to have all the teams staying in more than 2,500 hotel rooms downtown connected to the Indiana Convention Center. And there is extensive planning in place with health officials on conducting COVID-19 testing for everyone involved. A police officer charged with murder. Now the victim's family speaks out as defense lawyers prepare to their case. The latest coming up next. A white former police officer in Ohio has been charged with murder in the shooting death of Andre Hill. Today, Hill's family is speaking out about their fight for justice as the officer prepares to face a judge to be arraigned. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. Good morning, America, from Andre Hill's family. They haven't had many good mornings since December 22nd. Tonight, the family of Andre Hill, one step closer to justice with former Columbus, Ohio police officer Adam Coy, now behind bars. We're happy. I mean, it made my day yesterday and I don't want him to have died in vain. We want Adam Coy convicted of all the charges. A grand jury indicting Coy on multiple charges, including murder and felonious assault for the shooting death of Hill three days before Christmas. I believe the evidence in this case supports the indictment and my office will vigorously 
prosecute this case. Police body camera video shows the 47-year-old walking out of a friend's garage, a cell phone in his left hand. Hands out to the side now! Officers were reportedly responding to a call about a suspicious car when they encountered Hill next door. This angle from another responding officer who says she didn't see a weapon or any threat when fellow officer Adam Coy yelled, there's a gun in his other hand, and opened fire. Stop him up. He's still moving. Coy's attorney says evidence will show that he was justified in his use of force because he believed Hill was armed, but police say no weapons were found. He feels terrible that his actions on duty cause a loss of life. Even though he was mistaken that he didn't have a gun, that mistake was an honest belief and one that was reasonable based on the totality of the situation. The 19-year veteran of the force was fired less than a week after the shooting. Coy is expected to face a judge in court on Friday for arraignment. He's also facing two counts of dereliction of duty, one for not activating his body camera and the other for failing to inform his partner that he felt Hill was dangerous. His attorneys say he'll be pleading not guilty. Rena Roy, ABC News, San Francisco. Former Vice President Mike Pence has joined the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, as a distinguished visiting fellow. According to a statement from the foundation, Pence will advise the organization on policy. There are also plans for him to give a series of speeches and contribute to a monthly column. The column is for the Daily Signal, Heritage's multimedia news outlet. The world will soon learn more about the president's surviving son. Simon & Schuster is publishing Hunter Biden's memoir entitled Beautiful Things. It centers on his publicized struggles with substance abuse. Biden faced attacks about his past during his father's 2020 presidential campaign. Then candidate Joe Biden even had to address his son's history during a presidential debate. Beautiful Things will be published on April 6th. The poet that wowed a nation on Inauguration Day is getting her own Time magazine cover. Amanda Gorman is being featured on the Time magazine edition highlighting black creators. The national youth poet Lorette gained worldwide fame for reciting her poem, The Hill We Climb, during the January 20th ceremony. The publication hit stands on Friday. Wintry mess across central Indiana right now, but this is for Saturday. As the Arctic air arrives, so will another round of light snow. So you might have heard that dogs can sniff and tell if someone's infected with COVID. But one group of Indianapolis scientists is working on figuring out what dogs are smelling so they can make a breathalyzer to identify COVID in people. So this team at IUPUI School of Engineering and Technology are collecting breath samples now. Those samples then go into a machine for processing to help develop a sensor for the COVID breathalyzer. The team's goal is to have a breathalyzer identify COVID in someone, whether they're symptomatic or not with over 90% accuracy. They started this project last April and the team hopes to have a breathalyzer mass produced by the end of this year. There are a lot of benefits of the technology itself, regardless of whether it is for COVID or any other infectious disease. We really have a chance to make an impact in the community. It means a lot because I'm here to work, to help people through engineering. If we had a simple test that could be used if you want to be around people who are immune compromised or even elderly, this could maybe help open up nursing homes again. People can buy portable blood alcohol breathalyzers for just $50. The COVID breathalyzer could be just as affordable once it's produced. You can help the scientists with their research by giving them breath samples. They're especially looking for people who are not symptomatic, but had a positive COVID test in the last three to four days. Many women are going through pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum for the first time during the global pandemic. WRTV's Kelsey Anderson joins us now with how one woman is working to help all mothers navigate the changes. Whether it's lifting, cardio, or a mixture of both, many of us find mental clarity in working out and staying fit. An Indiana native, Sarah Bomar, says whether you're pregnant or in postpartum, you don't have to give that up. Sarah Bomar is from South Bend, Indiana. She went through her first pregnancy last year and now her baby Oakley is six months old. As this was her first pregnancy, Bomar noticed there was a lot of misinformation out there on what women can and cannot do while they're pregnant and in postpartum. So the certified personal trainer got another certification in prenatal and postpartum fitness training while she was pregnant. 
She then created this free guide for women to go to for all of their prenatal and postpartum questions in regards to fitness and nutrition. Because there's free bad information out there, so I wanted to make a guide with free good information for women because it's very overwhelming when you're pregnant all the books and everyone's opinions and all the doctor's appointments and you start researching all of these things and everything contradicts everything. Bomar says even if you are five or more years postpartum this guide can still be helpful to you. She says it doesn't matter when you start she just wants women to know this. You don't have to live in a body that doesn't make you feel good just because you had a baby. Working for you Kelsey Anderson WRTV. Are you a member of a book club? Listen to this. Researchers at the University of Liverpool found that group reading helped people confront the emotional challenges in dealing with chronic pain. Participants in the group reading were able to take the material from the books and relate it to their own lives during periods of reflection. Researchers say this provided additional benefits patients cannot get through cognitive behavioral therapy, which is often recommended for people with chronic pain. They say another benefit from group reading was the encouragement from other members of the group. Well, this evening, we've got a variety of weather still ongoing. As you look at the radar, and I've zoomed in on the metro area, I just want to point your attention towards Eagle Creek, Claremont, Brownsburg, Danville, up to Lebanon. The little brighter returns there, more likely with some sleet embedded within the rain, maybe some snow as well. Sleet's a little better radar target. That includes Martinsville down to Bloomington, although Bloomington's temperature well above the freezing mark right now in the upper 30s. There's the big picture. Notice western Indiana, the break just on a line west of Terre Haute and Lafayette. The precip coming to an end. That will march its way to the east over the next uh, three or four hours. Bloomington, 39 degrees with rain. 7 o'clock, we've got our ongoing precipitation. We'll go ahead and nudge that 100% chance you're going to see that mix. Then by 9, it drops. And then by 11, all of this should be over into Ohio. Metro area temperatures above freezing. Just because they're above freezing doesn't mean you won't find slick spots. Where you get a little heavier sleet and a little buildup on the roads, you do get slick conditions. It's not hard to tell where the nose of the coldest air sits. Look at Des Moines, Minneapolis, back up to portions of North Dakota where they're about ready to drop into the single digits. Although the precip ends tonight, the wind will continue to howl. It'll gust over 30 miles per hour. Notice the change in wind direction, and that pretty much corresponds to the moisture moving off to the east. We'll go from a south wind, which has helped the situation get temperatures above freezing, to a much colder west wind, and that'll drop the temperatures by morning to into the upper teens. Take this in two-hour time periods. By the time we get to 9 o'clock, there's your state divided. Dry west still. A wintry mix east by 11. That's over into the Buckeye State. Temperatures tomorrow with a mixture of clouds and sunshine. Quite a temperature range from lower 20s north to mid 30s south. Cold wind for all of us. It will gust over 30 miles per hour. It's possible we'll see some light snow showers to the south tomorrow evening. Over the weekend, clearly coldest part of the weekend will be on Sunday. And I want to point out, I think Sunday night into Monday, we'll have some light snow with the Arctic arrival. And uh, that will accumulate maybe one to possibly two inches. Here is your seven-day forecast. As you kind of soak it in, temperatures next week don't really warm up. We're not headed back above freezing for quite a while. The outlook through about the 19th of February calls for below average temperatures to continue. And that's what it looks like through next Thursday. We'll be back to finish up the news here at 7 right after this. The throne must pass to a male heir. Hakeem, it appears... You have a son. He must be found. Prepare the royal jet. We are going back to America. Oh, hell no, your majesty. Come on! Well, if you were a fan of the first movie, you only have another month to wait for the sequel. Amazon Prime Video has released the official trailer for Coming to America 2, Coming to America. That's with the number two, by the way. It's coming out more than 32 years after the original hit movie. Eddie Murphy, Arsenio Hall, and all the characters they played in the first movie are back. But the sequel also features Leslie Jones, Tracy Morgan, and Wesley Snipes, among others. Coming to America premieres on Amazon Prime Video on March 
5th. Can't wait for that one, right? And that'll do it for us here at 7 o'clock. Thanks for choosing WRTV News. Our next newscast is tonight at 11. Bundle up and stay safe out there.